Yeah, welcome back everyone. It's 2021. Um, we expected everything to be much better and it's much the same. Um, but the, the course will also be much the same because it was already good. I don't think anybody's going to be disappointed at the fact that the course is not going to get substantially better in 2021. Um, this is still a COVID free zone, if we're still saying that. Although I think we're all a bit tired of anything COVID related at this point. And we want to get back into some math, I guess. So let's do that. What are we doing? We're going to move towards the Hilbert transform. Towards the Hilbert transform. And I guess I've been threatening to do stuff on the Hilbert transform for weeks now. Now it's time to finally do it. Uh, just for people who haven't seen it before, I mean, I'm, I'm not really assuming people have done harmonic analysis, but I'm going to assume the results of harmonic analysis. The, the Hilbert transform is this operator here, at least for scalar valued functions. So for functions on the real line mapping into the scalar field C or real valued functions equally well. The Hilbert transform is a function for the operator H mapping F to this function H of F. And for variables X, um, it maps to, we've got a normalizing factor one on pi that's not particularly important. And we have this limit. I'm gonna write it like this, epsilon going to zero, capital epsilon going to infinity. I learned that capital epsilon just looks like an E. We integrate over Y of size between epsilon and I'm gonna say E rather than capital epsilon to confuse any so as to not confuse any non-Greek people. And we take this integral here. So this is what you'd call a, a singular integral operator because this kernel, this dy on y here, okay, we're integrating it on a restricted set of y so that this integral actually makes sense. But if we take all y, so we take epsilon to be zero, e to be infinity, this integral is not gonna exist because this kernel one on y is not integrable. Right, so we want this operator to make sense. So we look at these, these truncated Hilbert transforms here. These all make sense for every epsilon and E. And then we take the limit as epsilon goes to zero and E goes to infinity. And we hope that that limit exists. And it does exist at least for smooth compactly supported F, at least. It exists for more functions than that, but just as a starting point, we can say, yeah, this is defined for smooth compactly supported functions. The fact that that exists exploits the fact that this kernel one on Y actually has positive and negative values. It's not one on modulus of Y, it's one on Y. You need to have the positive and negative values to, to interact and cancel each other out. And yeah, for smooth compactly supported functions, this limit will exist. That's the Hilbert transform. Uh, I'm going to write this actually as a, this guy here is a convolution operator. This is F convolved with a kernel K epsilon E. If you remember what the definition of a convolution operator is. And yeah, this kernel K epsilon E is one on pi times the indicator function of the interval from epsilon to E applied to modulus of y, this gives the restriction on the integral, times one on y. So the Hilbert transform is a limit of convolution operators. It's not strictly a convolution operator because the, well, it is kind of a convolution operator, but the kernel one on y, you have to interpret it properly. And yeah, if you haven't seen the Hilbert transform before, you'd think, why would you define this? What's the point of that? It comes up in complex analysis. It comes up in a lot of places, but probably the most famous applications in complex analysis. So in complex analysis, what's the application of this operator? You let C plus be the upper half space in the complex plane. So this is complex number Z with imaginary part greater than zero. So you've got your complex plane here, this top part is C plus. And then the, the boundary of this set is the complex numbers with zero imaginary part, which is just the real line sitting inside the complex plane. So here's your, your boundary, the real line. 
Now, if you have a function f, a real valued function on the real line. So thinking of this function f as a function on the boundary of the upper half space. So for such an f, there exists a unique holomorphic function. I think it's unique. I don't think there's any restrictions here. Capital F. So complex valued, it's holomorphic, of course, on the upper half space, such that if you take f of s plus i t, or x plus i y, if you want to call your complex number that, and you look at the limit as t goes to zero, so s and t are, are real, right, of course. I forgot something. You take the real part of this, you take the limit as t goes to zero, you get f of s back. Remember, f is real valued, not complex valued, so f is the Small f is the real part of capital F at the boundary. You have to take this limit in the right sense. The way that I wrote it here is at least correct. How does the Hilbert transform come up? It comes up because if you take the limit as t goes to zero of the imaginary part of this function, you get the Hilbert transform of that. This is, yep. Uh, is the, are there some further restrictions to the F or do we probably I've probably forgotten one? some growth conditions or something on F. Um, I don't remember to be honest. Um, there are probably restrictions on F. Let's just put a little inverted quotes here. I can't remember the restrictions. I'll look them up and I'll correct it so in the notes. Just an, uh, there exists at most one basically. Or restrictions on the small F. Sorry. Yeah. Let's yeah. take for example, F in LP. <laughs> just to be really careful. Yeah, maybe that's how it is. I don't think there are restrictions on the capital F, but yeah, there are restrictions on the small F. You can't just do this for arbitrary F. Okay. Thanks. At least compactly supported smooth F, this is okay. Because <laughs> there we know the Hilbert, whenever the Hilbert transform works, you can do this, at least, I think. Let's take F and LP just to be careful. So yeah, there exists, certainly, I think it's unique, a capital F. The real part on the boundary is the function we started with. The imaginary part on the boundary turns out to be the Hilbert transform of that function. So the Hilbert transform gives you a way of computing what this imaginary part at the boundary is without actually computing the function capital F. You don't need to know what capital F is to get the Hilbert transform of F. Everything just is in terms of boundary data, right? You have this integral here. In the definition of the Hilbert transform, it makes no reference to capital F anywhere. So it's a, and it's, it's an important operator. It's useful. It comes up in other applications as well, but this is just the most immediate from the analysis viewpoint. Right now, I said that the Hilbert transform was defined. Well, I didn't say where it was defined. I said at least it makes sense for compactly supported smooth functions. In fact by calderon zygmunt theory, which you don't need to know, but if you know it, that's good. By calderon zygmunt theory or by other methods, the Hilbert transform is actually defined and bounded on LP, as long as P is between one and infinity. I'll just write to be precise here, it's defined and bounded. So it extends by boundedness by density of compactly supported smooth functions in LP to all of LP. Okay. And you can show that it's not bounded for L1 or L infinity. You can do that quite explicitly. This, I was gonna say there's some details in the notes, but there's not. Um, if you take the characteristic function of the unit interval, that's not in L1, it's not in L infinity, but the characteristic function itself is. So not defined or bounded on L1 or L infinity. Right, what do I wanna do with the Hilbert transform? This is all about the scalar valued Hilbert transform. And this is a course in Barnack valued analysis. So I better bring some Barnack spaces in somewhere. The question, which I mentioned at the, in lecture one, I think. <laughs> when does the Hilbert transform, which we consider as an operator on LP, when does the Hilbert transform admit a bounded 
X valued extension. Where X is a Banach space. The question should probably be stated for which X does the Hilbert transform have a bounded X valued extension? For some or all P between one and infinity. And you would remember from the introduction and from the countless times that I've said it, there's a theorem by Burkholder that says if X is a UMD space, so a Banach space with the UMD property, then for all P between one and infinity, H considered as an operator in LP, admits this X valued extension. It's a bounded X valued extension. Right. Just to remind everybody what I mean by bounded X valued extension, um, because the Hilbert transform is defined on LP on scalar valued functions. We can define the tensor extension, H tensor the identity map on the algebraic tensor product LP tensor X. Remember this is the span, the, the span of elementary tensors. So functions of the form scalar valued function F tensor of vector X. The linear span of those is the algebraic tensor product here. And this tensor extension H tensor identity acts on one of these elementary tensors by taking the scalar valued Hilbert transform of the scalar valued function F and tensoring that with the vector X. So we can always define that for any Banach spaces X. And what we need is we need the estimate in the, the X valued LP norm. We need an estimate like this for all F in that span of elementary tensors. Once you have that estimate, then you have a way of defining this tensor extension on the entire Bochner space LP valued in X and you're good. Right, um, are there any questions? Have we all forgotten the whole first part of the course? Hopefully we haven't. I forgot a bit of it. Okay. So that's the setup here and we're gonna prove Burkholder's theorem here over the, the next two lectures, hopefully takes a bit of work to do. It's not so easy. So we'll, the way we're going to do this is we'll consider what are called truncated Hilbert transforms. Now we've already seen these truncated Hilbert transforms. We just haven't given them a name for all epsilon and capital epsilon or E. We'll write it as H superscript X just to emphasize we're dealing with an operator on X valued functions. We're going to truncate it epsilon and E. We're going to look at an X valued function F and this is defined like the Hilbert transform, but yeah, with that restriction on Y. But we don't take the limit in epsilon. We just look at a fixed epsilon and capital epsilon and look at that operator there. This is a truncated Hilbert transform. This is for all F in LP. And these operators are actually bounded. There's no problem here about boundedness. These operators are bounded and well-defined on LP. This is bounded on LP. Quite simply, the reason is that this is a convolution operator with an L1 function. You have Young's inequality, it tells you that it's bounded. So just to write all of that down, if you look at the LP norm of this, this function, this is the LP norm of F convolved with this kernel from before. So this is one on Y restricted to the set of Y with modulus between epsilon and capital epsilon times one on pi, but the one on pi doesn't really matter. 
Young's inequality, or Young's integral inequality, because Young has a few inequalities. Young's inequality will tell you that this convolution operator is bounded with norm given by the, well, with norm bounded by the L1 norm with a kernel. And these L1 norms are actually finite. Let's say this is bounded by a constant depending on epsilon and capital epsilon. And I won't compute this constant explicitly, this, this L1 norm of the kernel. I'll just write it out as say, you've got two one pi dy on modulus of y. When you integrate the kernel, you have to replace y with modulus of y. You, you can't deal with any cancellation here. You're actually just taking a, a norm. I have a two because I have positive y and negative y. And this goes to infinity as epsilon goes to zero and or capital epsilon goes to infinity. All right. So this estimate will tell you that individual truncated Hilbert transforms are bounded, but it won't tell you that they are bounded uniformly as you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero or capital epsilon goes to infinity. So these bounds don't tell you anything about bounds for the Hilbert transform itself. But one good thing about this is it means that the truncated Hilbert transforms, at least they're always well-defined and always bounded on LP. You don't have any question there. We don't have to do any approximation by smooth, compactly supported functions or anything like that. These operators just exist. What we'll prove about truncated Hilbert transforms is that if X is UMD, And if we take P between one and infinity, then the norm of this truncated Hilbert transform, so as a bounded linear operator on the Bochner space, LPX, is bounded by a constant that only depends on P and X for all epsilon less than capital epsilon. The important point being that this constant is independent of those truncation parameters. So we'll prove uniform bounds for truncated Hilbert transforms. Of course, the Young's inequality doesn't give you such uniform bounds. It just gives you bounds. And this will imply the, the boundedness of the tensor extension of the Hilbert transform on the Bochner space, I should say, uh, for all F in the algebraic tensor product, we'll have this. This is what we want to bound. We want to bound it by the LP norm of F. This will actually be equal to the limit in the truncation parameters of the tensor extension of the truncated Hilbert transform on scalar valued functions. Actually, we're gonna deal with complex or real scalars, so I write K here. The reason this limit is justified is that we can basically think of X being finite dimensional here because we're dealing with a, a finite linear sum of elementary tensors. So we can restrict to a finite dimensional subspace and there's gonna be no issues with different types of limits in different norms, right? There's only really one topology here to work with. We just do it component-wise, the limit's true. This tensor extension of the truncated Hilbert transform on scalars is the truncated Hilbert transform on vector valued functions, of course. And then we'll have this bound that depends only on P and X by the LP norm of F. So in proving the, the fact that the Hilbert transform has a bounded X valued extension on LP, it will suffice to get uniform bounds for truncated Hilbert transforms. This doesn't address the question of whether the, the integral defining the Hilbert transform actually exists if you write it as a Bochner integral and consider it as X valued functions. This is done in the book analysis and Barnack spaces. It's a little bit harder. We're not gonna do that. All we're gonna prove is 
is this basically boundedness of the tensor extension on the Bochner space, which for us is enough. You can say more than that, but for us, this will do. If you didn't understand the thing I just said, don't worry about it, it's not important. So this is our goal to prove the, yeah, this estimate here, uniform bounds for truncated Hilbert transforms. And we have to do this using the UMD property. So we have to somehow reduce this to stuff about martingales. This is gonna be the tricky part. The Hilbert transform looks like it has nothing to do with martingales, right? How are we gonna get martingales in there? The thing that sort of motivates how the method works is considering the symmetries of the Hilbert transform. The Hilbert transform has a bunch of symmetries and it turns out it's essentially determined by the symmetries that it's got. It's a nice little observation. We have, we're gonna define a translation operator. We'll call it TR for translation. Translation by parameter S of a function F is this function here. You can take a function, you can translate the function, right? We'll have dilations by parameters lambda greater than zero. This is defined as, I'm gonna put a lambda to the minus one half out the front so that this is an L2 normalized dilation. So if I have a function F in L2 and I dilate it like this, the L2 norm doesn't change. Although that normalization factor out the front doesn't matter. You can put any factor here, it's fine. I'm also going to define a reflection. This notation, refl for reflection is not standard, but you know, I like it better than the other ones. You can reflect a function like that by flipping the variable, right? The Hilbert transform has symmetries with respect to these things. It commutes with translation. So the Hilbert transform of a translated function is the translation of the Hilbert transform of the function. Uh, the Hilbert transform of a dilated function is the dilation of the Hilbert transform of the function. So the Hilbert transform commutes with dilations and it anti-commutes with reflections. So if I reflect a function f and then take the Hilbert transform, it's the same as taking minus the reflection of the Hilbert transform of f. So Hilbert, just to summarize all of that, the Hilbert transform, this is on scalar valid functions, by the way, it's the same for vector valid functions, but it doesn't matter. Commutes with translations and dilations and anti-commutes with reflections. Doesn't commute with reflections, but anti-commutes. If you think of the identity operator, that commutes with translations and dilations and also commutes with reflections. So almost the same symmetries as the identity operator, but it anti-commutes with reflections rather than commuting. So this one here is pretty important. The Hilbert transform is actually determined by these symmetries. I'm gonna write determined in quotes because there's a couple of caveats here. You have to have, it's, it's determined by these symmetries among all bounded operators on L2 and among all bounded operators on LP, you have to have some conditions there. Actually all scalar valued, all scalar multiples of the Hilbert transform are determined by this. Because of course, if you take the Hilbert transform, it satisfies these, these identities, but if you then multiply it by a scalar, that operator also satisfies these identities. In particular, you can also take C equals zero. <laughs> the zero operator also satisfies these symmetries somewhat trivially. It commutes and anti-commutes with reflections being zero. So we're not gonna explicitly use this fact. We're also not gonna prove it. It's easy enough to prove if you know what the Hilbert transform is as a Fourier multiplier. But we're gonna use this fact that the Hilbert transform is determined by these symmetries in order to tell us how we should actually represent the Hilbert transform in terms of martingales. We're gonna have some operators, they're gonna be martingale transforms that are bounded for UMD spaces because martingale transforms are bounded on UMD spaces. And we're gonna take these martingale transforms and then force them to have the same symmetries as the Hilbert transform. They're not going to have those symmetries, but we're going to force them to in a way. And by doing that, we're going to get 
operators built out of martingale transforms that have the symmetries of the hilbert transform it's going to follow that they are the hilbert transform up to a scalar multiple we're not going to use this theorem we're just going to prove directly that we're recovering the hilbert transform but this gives you the motivation at least like it tells you if you do some procedure to force these symmetries you're going to have to get the hilbert transform coming out of that that's the motivation of all of this Keep that in mind. I'll remind you periodically that this is the motivation. This is why we're doing the constructions that we're doing, because the constructions we're going to do seem, if you don't have this motivation, they seem to come out of nowhere. <laughs> you need to have this in mind the whole way through. So let's start the proof, or at least start developing the methods we need to do the proof. Let's start a new screen. And let's do a definition. Were there any questions about all that before I start defining things? Seems not. Good. So we're going to define what are called shifted dyadic systems. Something new. You know about dyadic intervals? I've been talking about dyadic subintervals of the unit interval for some time now. We're going to extend that. So shifted dyadic systems. So we'll start by defining non-shifted dyadic systems and then shift them. For integer j, let's define this set d0j to be the set of all intervals of the form 2 to the minus j, interval from k to k plus 1, ranging over all integer k. So these are all subintervals of the real line. They've all got length 2 to the minus j, and they're basically spaced along the integer points. So this is the set of all dyadic intervals of length 2 to the minus j in R. And when I say dyadic intervals, I mean, I'm saying that their, their length is a power of 2, but also they're spaced evenly in a certain sense. I have this interval here that everything is based off. Uh, define d0 with no j to be the union of all of these sets. So d0 is just the set of all dyadic intervals in R. So you've got length being a power of 2, you have this evenly spaced thing happening. So just to draw a nice little picture, if this is the real line. So let's put some markings in here. Then these intervals here that have length one, these are the intervals in D zero, zero, two to the zero being one. I've also got these intervals of length two. This is D zero minus one. I've got intervals of length one half. These are the, this is the set D zero one and so on. Uh, you should think of the parameter J as being like a zoom level. Uh, as j gets large, the intervals get small. You start to look close as j increases. That's why d minus 1 has larger intervals. And you have arbitrarily large intervals here, of course, because you can have arbitrarily large powers of 2. This is what d0 minus 2 would look like. It has to go all the way out to infinity, of course. Yeah. This d0 is what we'll call the standard dyadic system. Nothing shifted yet. Now we'll define the shifted dyadic systems. They have an extra parameter. And their parameter is something a bit weird. It's a parameter omega, which is in the set 0, 1 to the power of the integers. So omega has the form. It's a two-sided infinite sequence. looking like this, where each of the entries is zero or one. We've dealt with this set before, but with but parameterized by the natural numbers rather than the integers. So we have to have two-sided sequences here. So for every one of these parameters, 
for all zoom levels j, we will define d sub j superscript omega to be the set d zero j that we had before. So the dyadic intervals of length two to the minus j, standard ones. And we're gonna shift that whole set by the following number, which looks pretty contrived, but turns out to make a lot of sense, this number here. So let me just give that a little bit of explanation. We can write that number as two to the minus j times the sum from i for i greater than j of two to the j minus i omega i. Just to rewrite what this definition is, that doesn't tell you anything yet. We call this number omega superscript bracket j. And this number is between zero and one. So all of these omega i's are zero or one. And then we have powers of two where we have j minus i with i greater than j. So this is basically a binary representation of a number between zero and one. If you write omega j in base two, it's zero point omega j plus one, omega j plus two, dot, 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 base two representation. You just think of dyadic decimal, binary decimals here, yeah? And that's, yeah, this is just the definition. So we have some number between zero and one determined by the parameter omega as a binary expansion. We scale it by two to the minus j. So now we have a number between zero and two to the minus j. And we have this set of intervals of length two to the minus j. So we're taking our set of intervals and then shifting it by some number that goes between zero and the length. Because once you shift by two to the minus j, you've done nothing to the set. You've just shift, you've moved every interval over to the next interval. And every interval gets replaced by the previous interval. So it makes sense that the shift parameters between zero and two to the minus j when you're at scale j. So if I draw the picture, this is R. Say, let's put zero here. And we draw the set of standard dyadic intervals of length one, so d zero zero. And we'll have our parameter omega and that will give some number here say this is omega zero is between zero and one. And we get this set of intervals, which is a bit shifted. So this number here is omega zero. This is omega zero plus one. This is omega zero minus one and so on. So we take our set of intervals at a certain length and then we shift it over a little bit. And the, the reason you define it like this with a fixed parameter omega, and then you define this confusing little thing here. Whoops, didn't want to, I wanted to highlight that. Yeah. The reason we define it like this is that we get some compatibility relations between all of the different scales. So I'm going to draw a big diagram. I'm hoping the diagram will make sense. Imagine you're looking at a fixed scale here you're looking at some d omega j. It's going to be a bunch of intervals. Of length two to the minus j. And say, suppose this number here is omega j plus zero. Right, so this will be one of the sets of intervals. The way that this is defined is that when you look one scale up. So when you when you increase j by one, so you zoom in a little bit. It's going to look exactly like the standard dyadic system. Each of these intervals is going to split in two. This is going to be d omega j plus one. Because the number omega j plus one is just going to be two to the j plus one times the number zero point W j plus two, W j plus one, whatever, plus three, whatever, base two expansion. And this number is just, it's determined by the previous omega j. Two to the j, zero point omega j plus one, omega j plus two, dot, dot, dot. Once you know omega j, there's no freedom in determining what omega j plus one is. Omega j plus one is determined by omega j. 
So when you're looking at the dyadic intervals here at a fixed scale J, you know what's happening at all of the higher scales. At all of the higher zoom levels, you know exactly how the system of intervals looks. But when you're looking at omega J minus one, that's not determined by omega J anymore. There are basically two choices in terms of omega J. So omega J is determined by omega J minus one, but does not determine omega J minus one. You've got two choices of what that binary digit that's missing can be. And what this translates to when you're looking at this dyadic system here. So let's just write all the endpoints of the intervals. That's what we need here. So we saw that this interval here splits into two smaller intervals. You've got like a left and a right sub interval but you have a choice as to whether this interval here itself is the left or the right sub interval of the previous step, right? So this, you know, is left to right. Every interval is either a left or a right sub interval here. This can be left or right, this interval here. So either it's the left sub interval of this larger interval here, or the other possibility is that it's the right sub interval. So that's the other possibility. So just to draw them both, there's two options for what the larger interval can be. And these correspond to the two choices of that missing binary digit in omega j minus one. This is all very convoluted. I know this, this is difficult when you see it for the first time, but the point I want to make is that this definition is made in such a way that when you look at a fixed scale, everything at smaller scales smaller intervals is determined. But you have some freedom in saying what the larger scales are. That's what all of this is about. So you'll make a certain choice and then you're you make this will erase. The set D omega J minus one will look like that. It'll either look like that or it'll be shifted by a certain amount for the other possibility. And then you do that at every scale. The way that you parameterize all of this properly is you take omega as a two-sided sequence of zeros and ones and you define it in this way. That's the whole point of this. Yeah, it's a bit convoluted when you see it for the first time. So we define all these different shifted dyadic systems. They're like the standard dyadic system, but you have a little bit of freedom as to where everything sits. And the reason we do this is because we need to build operators that have translation invariants. And the standard dyadic system is very much not translation invariant. Anyway, I'm going to move past this. Either you understood it or you didn't. I'm hoping more people understood it than didn't. And well, maybe I'll come I back can to make this a discussion. little comment here. Yeah. I mean, another another thing you could try to do just take the whole dyadic grid and translate it back and for forced by real numbers, right? You can also do but, that. But then your problem is that the uh, the, uh, uh, the group of transformations doesn't have finite measure somehow, right? The whole real, you want the average over all translates, but the set of translates doesn't have finite measure. Yeah. So you're building here thing. some sort of uh, Hamming cube, right? This is exactly. what this is, and it's so, gonna have finite measure. Yep. Let me explain and, this in a slightly different way. Okay. We could okay. translate by a translation parameter T in the real line. But we don't have a nice way of averaging over all translations when we do that because the real line has infinite measure. But we can encode T as a binary representation. And then we can put a product measure on this. Product measure where each of the factors is a probability measure. So we just randomly choose zero or one in every coordinate. And this gives you a probability measure. So then we can take an average over all of these omegas. And it turns out that when you define it in this way, the thing you get is translation invariant. <laughs> but you have to define it in this way for that to work. This is basically, yeah, as you said, this is a clever way of, make, of letting yourself average over translations in a way that's meaningful. Yeah, well, it's a bit mind boggling because I don't, Definitely. at the moment, I couldn't really say what's actually happening. How come the real line all of a sudden has finite measure and, and it's, I mean, yeah. somehow it happened. Uh, I, I mean, see. I guess in some sense it's more than the real line, right? It is more than the real because line. Because it's thing. it's kind of like infinite numbers with infinitely many digits. Yeah. And I guess probably all the real numbers have measure zero in this or something. 
Will it have measure zero in that? I'm not sure about that, but it will be. Because, I mean, you have to have zero in infinitely many places. Yeah. And then that probably should give you measure zero. It would make sense, yeah. These are kind of generalized translations in a way. Maybe that's another way to put it. It's, it is all mind boggling, definitely. It's a quite deep construction here. <laughs> yeah. We'll see why it's used later on. I mean, we're gonna have a break in a couple of minutes anyway, so I won't get to that yet, obviously, but yeah. Let me just go back to the definition just to, other than the, we should look at the definition rather than the picture, just to be really clear what this thing is. This is the key definition here. What's the definition of the intervals at scale J? It's a standard dyadic intervals shifted by this particular number coming from omega. All right. And then of course we will define D omega to be the union over all scales J of D omega J. And this is then a, a shifted dyadic system. Shifted by omega. Um, I think now is a good time for a break because there's some more material that won't fit before the break. Also, it's about eleven. So, are there any questions before we have our fifteen-minute break? No. All right. Yeah, it, 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 oh, it yeah. reminds me of compactification. Maybe it's a measure theoretic analog of compactification, right? If you if you have a space that's not compact, you actually make it bigger to make it compact, which is a, a it's a good analogy that yeah. counterintuitive. And here you seem to make a measure space of infinite measure bigger, and yeah. all of a sudden it has finite measure, right? Yeah. <laughs> or rather yeah. has zero measure inside the finite measure thing, right? Uh, yeah, it's a bit weird. Said, uh, I don't know how much to what extent you can do this really generally and keep all of this structure like this is really respecting the arithmetic structure of the real line in a pretty rigid way like it's definitely more than just a measure theoretic thing there's all of the structure of the real line is coming in here yeah very nice construction anyway yep. yeah i didn't come up with it <laughs> so I have to, i'm not going to take you have, the, you have the luxury of presenting it to us yeah. yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> Cool, let's take a break. Yeah.